Chapter One of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marshall returns from America. In the latter half of August, Marshall Stokes went to New York in order to wind up the estate of the lately deceased brother of the lady to whom he was betrothed as a busy underwriting member of lloyd's he could ill afford the time he was over there for upwards of a fortnight but no alternative had presented itself miss lomont had no connections in america she possessed no other relations except a widowed aunt with whom she lived and it was clearly out of the question for either of the two ladies to travel across in person to examine books interview lawyers deal with claims etc they had not the necessary business experience the task therefore had devolved on marshall he had not been able to conclude the business but he had put it in a fair way of being concluded and had appointed a reputable firm to act as miss lomont's representatives the estate was worth forty thousand dollars upon his return to london about the middle of september he found that his friends had departed for brighton mrs moore the aunt apparently was feeling run down a perfumed little note from isbel pressed him to join them there marshall was unable to leave town immediately but two days later on friday afternoon he abruptly shut down work for the weekend and motored down by himself in glorious weather his heart was high and as he ran through the richly gleaming sussex country overspread with a blue plum-like bloom arising from the september mists he thought that he had never seen anything quite so lovely the sun was brilliant and there was a crisp invigorating breeze he dined the same evening with isbel and her aunt in the public room at the hotel gondi where they were staying neither of the ladies attracted as much attention as marshall himself his large loose powerful figure went admirably with evening dress while his full-blooded face still covered with ocean tan was peculiarly noticeable for its heavy good-humoured immobility his very hands huge and crimson yet not vulgar marked him out from other men Isbel kept alternately glancing at him and smiling down at her plate with pleasure, apropos of nothing. Most of the talking came from him. Reserving business until afterwards, he entertained his friends during the meal with his personal experiences in the United States, the relation of which was rendered more piquant by a free adoption of the very latest slang. Aunt and niece were both perfectly acquainted with America, but they had the tact to keep this to themselves. Isbel was dressed in black on account of her brother's death. The gown, according to the prevailing fashion, was cut low across her somewhat full bosom, but lower still in the back. She was neither plain nor handsome. A first glance showed an ordinarily attractive girl of five-and-twenty and nothing more. Her face was rather short and broad, with thick but sensitive features, a lowish forehead, and a dull, heavy skin, rendered almost unnaturally pale by the excessive quantity of powder she employed. The tranquillity of her expression was rarely broken by an emotion or a smile, but whenever this did happen, it was like a mask lifting. The full, grey-black eyes, as a rule, appeared a trifle bored and absent, but occasionally they narrowed into a subtle and penetrating glance, which nearly resembled a stab. Her hair was long and fine, but mouse-coloured. She was short rather than tall, and somewhat too broad-hipped for modern ideas of beauty. Nevertheless, her person was graceful and well-covered. She moved with style, while her hands and feet were particularly small and aristocratic. She affected little jewellery. She commanded all her friends, and was adored by the two or three nearest to her. Further, no matter what company she was in, and although she never exerted herself to win people, before the evening was out, her personality 
always succeeded in making itself felt and she became the centre of interest to men and women alike never self-conscious never embarrassed always quiet and rather ennuyée she fascinated by the very strength of her silence which it was abundantly clear had nothing in common with stupidity she had already declined three offers of marriage before marshall had appeared on her horizon curiously enough these offers had all been made by men very much older than herself she had a queer habit while sitting of constantly though quite unconsciously attending her person she would keep putting her hand to her hair adjusting her skirt feeling her waistband altering the position of a necklace or bracelet etc it was not vanity but a sort of nervous irritability which prevented her from continuing still her aunt frequently cautioned her against the fault which was one of those that grow by indulgence isbel would deny the offence and five minutes later would begin to repeat it the strange thing was that a good many persons of the other sex liked to watch her toying with her garments in this way she was perfectly well aware of the fact and it rather disgusted her mrs moore the third member of the party had just entered her sixtieth year she was as already mentioned a widow her husband a stockbroker in a small way had during the rubber boom amassed a sudden fortune which fell to her intact upon his death in nineteen hundred and eleven by shrewd speculation she had increased it considerably since and could now be regarded as a wealthy woman isbel's father who had died nearly at the same time was her younger brother he was a widower with only one other child a son the one who had recently died in new york isbel who at that time was sixteen became Anne Moore's ward under the will. She was at once removed from school, rather against her desire, and the two women commenced the more or less vagrant existence together, which they had continued ever since, drifting from hotel to hotel in all quarters of the globe. It was a free life, and Isbel came to grow extremely fond of it. In any case, her own money was not sufficient to support her, so that in a manner she was dependent upon her aunt's whims it only remains to add that she tyrannised over the older woman in all her personal relations and that the latter not only permitted this but even seemed to expect it as a natural thing mrs moore was short erect and dignified with a somewhat stiff carriage her face which resembled yellow marble bore a consistently stern and dauntless impression rarely relaxing into a smile she was in complete possession of all her faculties and her health generally speaking was good the art of dressing she did not understand isbel selected her garments for her while her maid told her when and how to put them on she was in fact one of those eccentric women who ought to have been born men her tastes were masculine her knowledge chiefly related to masculine topics she knew for instance how to invest her money to the best advantage how to buy and sell land and how to plan a serviceable house but what she did not know was how to flatter men how to talk gracefully about nothing how to interest herself in the minute details of another woman's household or how to identify herself in thought with the members of the upper circles of society she bowed to no authority and took pride in speaking her mind in whatever company she might find herself the natural consequence was that while her friends esteemed her highly for her genuine qualities they were more than a little frightened of her and never really regarded her as one of themselves it sometimes dawned on her that she was lonely on such occasions she sought solace in music she loved everything classical beethoven in particular she venerated but the history of music came to an end for her with brahms weeks would pass without her once opening the piano and then a sudden almost passionate yearning would seize her when she would sit down and play by the hour together her execution was bold slow rather coarse full of deep feeling 
the two women were excessively fond of each other though neither cared to show it temperamentally however they were so antagonistic that frequent quarrels were inevitable whenever this happened the aunt ordinarily expressed herself in vigorous language while isbel on the other hand would become sullen and vindictive saying little but requiring time to be appeased as soon as dinner was concluded the trio retired to mrs moore's private apartment on the first floor the waiter brought up coffee and chartreuse the room was handsomely appointed a distinctive note being lent to it by the bowls of pale chrysanthemums with which it was profusely and artistically decorated isbel's labour of love the evening was chilly and a small fire was burning in the grate they brought their chairs forward so as to form a semicircle round the hearth isbel being in the middle she stretched a languid hand up and took two cigarettes from an open box on the mantel-shelf passing one to marshall and keeping one herself mrs moore very rarely smoked for some twenty minutes they talked to business marshall told them exactly what he had accomplished on the other side and what still remained to be done anyhow said mrs moore it seems the main difficulties have been got over and the money's quite safe for isbel oh quite she may have to wait some months before she can touch it that's the only thing isbel took little sips of coffee and looked reflectively into the fire no doubt you'll find a use for it isbel when it does come oh it's more sentimental aunt naturally i don't want to go to marshall with empty hands the others protested simultaneously you needn't cry out said the girl calmly i know it's done every day but that's no reason why i should be content to follow suit after all why should a married woman be a parasite it makes her out to be a kind of property and that's not the worst very well child you've got the money don't make a fuss isbel's right mind you said marshall there's a decent amount of cold horse sense about what she says a girl wants to feel independent i'm not gifted with a great deal of imagination but i can see it must be pretty rotten to have to keep on good terms with a man even when she's not feeling like it simply and solely for the sake of his cash i wasn't thinking so much of my attitude as yours replied isbel oh that is rather uncalled for it isn't at all likely that a question of private means is going to affect my behaviour what made you come out with that oh i don't mean it in your sense said isbel i don't mean anything brutal or tyrannical of course i simply say that your whole attitude towards me would be unconsciously modified and you couldn't help it being a man the mere knowledge that you held the purse would be bound to make you kinder and more chivalrous towards me that would be a lifelong humiliation i should never be able to feel quite sure whether you were being kind to me or to my poverty rot exclaimed marshall that sort of thing doesn't exist in married life i couldn't bear to ask for love and be fed with sympathy her voice was cold quiet and perfectly unembarrassed you girls are all the same said mrs moore pettishly you have that word love on the brain most married women are very thankful to have an occasional dish of sympathy set before them i can assure you we all know what love without sympathy is what pure brutal egotism my dear if that's what your heart is crying for so much the worse for you perhaps that's what i want all the same every woman has a savage streak in her they say i should probably always sell myself to the highest bidder in love you'd better look out marshall well it's a lucky thing we both know you as well as we do said her aunt dryly the question is do you know me isbel fingered the lace of her corsage the question is what is there to know girls may be exceedingly mysterious to young men but they are not in the least mysterious to old women my dear you've overindulged in russian literature lately her niece laughed as if unwillingly if all girls are so hopelessly alike what becomes of ancestral traits you don't claim more ancestors than other people i hope 
what is this new pose of inscrutability child marshall thought it high time to interrupt the duel which threatened to develop into something unpleasant to change the subject he said rather hastily have you got fixed for a house yet mrs moor no i haven't why would sussex suit you isbel anticipated her aunt's reply turning to him with a friendly smile as if anxious to counteract the impression caused by her free speaking have you heard of something whereabouts in sussex near staining you get there from worthing don't you you get there from anywhere in a car it's not far from brighton tell us all about it what kind of a house is it surely i may speak isbel said her aunt irritably is it a large property marshal how did you come to hear of it it's an elizabethan manor two hundred acres of ground go with it mostly timber the hall goes back to the thirteenth century i met the owner coming across and the price he declined to say off-hand as a matter of fact he's not frightfully keen on selling at all his wife's just died in san francisco so i snatched the opportunity and asked him what his plans were about going back he hasn't decided yet but i've got a sort of idea that a prompt bid might do the trick if it at all appeals to you poor fellow at least i hope so young or old he told me his age fifty-eight he was in the birmingham brass trade his name's judge you don't know him by any chance do we isbel no he's quite a decent chap he and his wife have lived at runhill court for eight years so it sounds all right is that the name of the house yes historical supposed to be derived from the old saxon runehill so he says the runes were engraved letters intended to keep off the trolls and blendings i don't suppose that interests you greatly what's more to the point is that the place is thoroughly up to date he tells me he spent no end on modern improvements electric lighting and so forth well now do you feel disposed to take it up mrs moor wriggled in her chair which was a sign of indecision isbel emitted clouds of cigarette smoke in the manner of women an elizabethan manner she remarked reflectively sounds thrilling is there a family ghost do you want one in any case you wouldn't have to live there long child her aunt's tone was sharp that is unless you've been altering your programme you two behind my back we are not conspirators thanks it is still to be april then pray leave me to make my own arrangements when could i go over to the house marshal any time i fancy would you care to have judge's address in town please he scribbled it on a scrap of paper and passed it over isbel eyed him thoughtfully aren't you coming with us marshal really i wasn't thinking of doing so of course if you'd like me to we should said mrs moor what day would suit you best there you have me he hesitated well as we're all here together what's wrong with tomorrow morning i could run you over in the car the country's looking magnificent mrs moor consulted the paper in her hand but mr judge is in town you say how can we get an order to view between now and tomorrow morning yes i see as a matter of fact i have an order in my pocket but my dear boy in that case why did you wish me to go to the trouble of communicating with mr judge yes why did you supplemented isabel puckering her brow the order's a personal one you see and, and i had no idea i was coming with you the girl stared at him in a sort of bewilderment do you mean you intended to go alone without us well yes i i purposely didn't tell you because it's more or less a confidential matter but the fact is judge wants a private opinion from me with regard to one of the rooms go on what sort of opinion do you mean he's planning an alteration or what not an alteration exactly as far as i'm aware i i'm very sorry isabel but it's confidential as i said before having passed my word of course i'm not at liberty to say anything more about it much as i should like to however i shall be only too happy to accompany you both she slowly passed her palm backward and forward across her skirt feeling its texture it's very strange though 
so you meant to hide it from us altogether this mysterious transaction i meant to keep my word in plain language you set out a higher value on the regard of this total stranger than on ours i don't care two pins about the room or what he proposes to do with it but i certainly do care that but my dear girl why have you done it it's disquieting i shan't know what you're keeping back now mrs moore gazed sternly at her niece do not try to be a fool isbel if marshall has passed on his word do you want him to break it he's perfectly in the right only of course you must try to work up a scene just tell us right out marshall would you rather have us with you or not i shall be delighted to have you with me ten thirty in the morning will that suit admirably well that's that now you can go downstairs you two i want to read i shan't see you again to-night marshall good-night ring for the waiter please as you go past i want these things cleared away she remained sitting bolt upright in her chair waiting for the servant to come and go when it was her intention not to read she had changed her mind at the very moment of expressing it but to play these wretched misunderstandings over nothing at all always left her with an unpleasant taste in her mouth which she could only rid herself of by entering that other world of pure and lofty idealism the two younger people walked slowly downstairs isbel slightly leading the way shall we see if we can get a game of billiards asked marshall in a somewhat subdued voice if you like as they passed by the drawing-room the door was wide open the room was empty let's come in here said the girl they did so she shut the door after them both remained on their feet may i ask began isbel and a spot of colour came into her cheeks if it is your intention to keep confidences from me i wish to know my dear isbel yes or no her tone was quietly menacing marshall felt that the shaping of his whole future very likely depended on the next few words addressed by him to this tranquil dangerous-mannered girl in black he reflected before answering of course if you put it in that way isbel i i mean to keep nothing from you i gave my word to judge it's true but i quite see that perhaps i had no right to give it i fully realise that personal secrets vitiate the whole meaning of marriage then we'll say no more about it i'm glad if we held different views on the subject it would be rather ominous wouldn't it but what really is your compact with this man what does he want you to do exactly he's quite a stranger isn't he oh absolutely then tell me i shan't talk i know that in any case the affair isn't one of national importance the truth is this chap judge once had or thought he had a succession of marvellous experiences in one of the rooms at runhill an attic on the top story which rejoices in the name of the east room it happened just after he'd moved into the house eight years ago and apparently it's been weighing on his mind ever since for some unknown reason it pleases him to imagine that i possess an average quantum of common sense on which account he has invited my assistance in clearing up the mystery in a soft moment i agreed and that's all there is to it but i don't understand why you what made him fix on you i can't really say it just resulted from a casual friendly conversation on board ship coming home we happened to be discussing the fourth dimension and all that sort of thing what were these marvellous experiences of his then a species of delusion i take it every morning for a week on end a flight of stairs used to appear to him in that room leading up out of a blank wall he avers that he not only saw them but used to go up them but he hasn't the vaguest recollection of what took place on top what an extraordinary fancy eventually his wife found him out at it that is of course she saw nothing but it frightened him off he had the room locked and no one has set foot in it from that day to this now she's dead he appears to think there's no longer the same necessity for secrecy does he look mad not in the least far from it and you actually promise to investigate my dear girl what could i do 
i couldn't tell the man to his face that he was a lunatic could i there was no way out of it it will be an excuse for a run in the car anyway so you agreed simply to spare his feelings we'll put it that way i think it was rather fine of you marshall i'm glad you've told me i must know all your affairs you see that don't you of course i see it having gained her point she swiftly took him in both arms and lifted her lips to be kissed they both laughed marshall however remained uneasy after they had separated again for obviously it was no place for love-making he thoughtfully scrutinized her powdered face with its steady indecipherable eyes while we're by ourselves perhaps you'll tell me isbel what exactly did you mean just now by that remark about selling yourself to the highest bidder in love are you serious or pulling my leg yes i must have love said the girl quietly i don't contest it but the point is you seem to regard love as a sort of jam to be taken in a spoon there's no such thing as love independent of a person it appears to be a matter of indifference to you who that person is so long as he makes it sufficiently sweet for you don't let's quarrel i didn't say it to vex you it isn't sweetness that i want what then isbel was silent for a moment she turned half away from him feeling the back of her hair with her white tapering fingers i don't know love must be stronger than that i mean one girl might be content with mere placid affection and another might ask for nothing better than a thick sentimental syrup it depends on character my character is tragic i fancy i hope not he stood looking rather puzzled tell me one thing isbel you're not by any chance finding our engagement monotonous are you oh no sure quite sure but isn't it a rather extraordinary question marshall gazing at her quietly mocking smile grew suddenly inflamed i suppose you realize in your heart of hearts that you can do what you like with me and that's why you're so contemptuous it's a feeble thing to say but i'd rather go on struggling for your good opinion all my life isbel than be worshipped by any other woman without an effort on my part you will always have my good opinion if that's all you want he flushed up and took a step towards her as she awaited him with the same smile the handle of the door turned noisily from the outside they started guiltily away from each other then we'll see if we can get a game of billiards remarked isbel in a conversational voice turning her neck to glance at the two ladies who were entering marshall assented and they at once left the room End of chapter 1「The Visit to Runhill Court」After the breakfast on Saturday morning, Marshall brought the car round. He strolled up and down for some time, smoking, before the ladies made their appearance in the portico of the hotel. Isbel wore a new travelling ulster with a smart check. Her small black satin hat was completed by a floating veil. Her face was powdered, and she was rather heavily scented. Mrs. Moore's short, commanding person was dressed with plain dignity. She looked the more distinguished of the two. Isbel walked round the new car, appraising it critically. Marshall had bought it two months earlier, but delivery had been postponed until his return from America looks rather ladylike he apologized but it's a devil to go aunt and niece were in the best of humours the morning was ideal for motoring while an objective of course made it so much more interesting it was hot breathless misty a typical september day the sun beat down from a cloudless sky and the sea was like milk crowds of holiday-makers thronged the parade a piano organ up some back street was rattling out a popular tune everyone looked in good health and free from care can we get back for lunch demanded the older lady 
we'll do our best it's about fifteen miles each way i take it come on then and don't waste time as isbel lightly touched marshall's arm in following her aunt into the back seat she gave him an intimate smile their somewhat dangerous conversation of the preceding evening was forgotten and both felt the engagement to be a wonderful thing climbing in behind the wheel the underwriter's face took on a deeper colour they started the girl was delighted with the easy running of the car its power smoothness and silence were something impressive she was voluptuous by nature and enjoyed luxurious travel just as she enjoyed every form of softness mrs moore for her part sat as nearly upright as the thickly padded cushions would permit staring severely at the throng which gradually thinned as they approached hove their road ran through portslade shoreham and up the valley of the adur the sun steadily increased in power while the morning mists insensibly dissipated they passed from sunshine to shadow and from shadow to sunshine fanned all the time by their own wind isbel's first exhilaration faded she wrinkled her brow and grew dreamy pensive vaguely anxious nature always had this effect on her streets ships crowds any form of human activity enabled her to forget herself but natural surroundings threw her back on her own mental resources and then the whole emptiness and want of purpose of her life loomed up in front of her her aunt viewed the changing landscape sternly these trees these fields and meads but above all those bare downs of grass-covered chalk in the background were to her sacred isbel respected her mood and made no attempt at conversation presently they came to bramber and stenning at the latter place marshall slowed down to inquire the way and was instructed to take the left-hand fork about a mile further on runhill court would be roughly three miles northwest from that point but the road was a complicated one the downs were on their left chanctonbury ring with its crest of dark trees dominated the whole country the sun blazed while a plague of flies swarmed round the car which had to crawl as soon as they entered the puzzling network of by-lanes they met few people and the way was hard to pick up in consequence of which it was already nearing twelve when at last they drew up before the lodge gate at their destination beyond the gate a winding carriage drive went forward to the house which was out of sight it was bordered on either side by the usual shrubbery of rhododendrons hollies etc on the left again was a rising park containing some fine specimens of beech while to the right a real wood appeared the extent of which however could not be seen an ancient moss-grown red brick wall bounded the estate on the other side of the narrow lane which passed the lodge were meadowlands fringed by a line of tall elms which effectually shut out the view it was a solitary and charming spot the air was peculiarly sweet clean yet heavy with fragrance as marshall was in the act of getting down a middle-aged woman emerged from the lodge she was smoothing her dress and hair and evidently had just removed an apron he produced judge's order the woman took it in her hand and proceeded to read it passing her thumb under each line from side to side of the sheet while her lips silently framed the words she was a tall big-boned fresh-complexioned person of the upper servant type handsome in a common way but with sarcastic eyes her hair was thick and yellow having examined the signature musingly she turned again to him when did you want to see the house sir now if we may she stared at one of the buttons of his coat that makes it rather awkward sir i gave the house key to an american gentleman a short time back and he's still over there will you wait i didn't know you admitted the general public we don't sir this was another order like yours 
someone mr judge picked up on the other side no doubt well mrs mrs priday sir well mrs priday i don't see that it matters at all we shan't interfere with each other as the house is open i suppose we can get in oh yes but did you wish me to show you over if you will i must find my husband first before i can leave the lodge he's working somewhere in the grounds he's head gardener here will the ladies step inside and wait sir well look here mrs priday we're somewhat pressed for time so if you'll open the gate we'll just run up to the house and be starting you can follow when you're ready as you please sir replied the caretaker with an almost imperceptible shrug she proceeded without any great show of alacrity to unlatch and swing open the, the carriage gate and meanwhile marshall returned to the car which a minute later passed slowly through the entrance to the drive travelling at low speed they obtained round the first bend about three hundred yards further on their first view of the house it stood on high ground and cool dark green lawns sloped down from it on all four sides the front which they approached faced the south-east it was a large edifice in the elizabethan style but the exterior had been so renovated and smartened perhaps by judge that it looked almost a modern erection the irregular many gabled roof was bright with new tiles the facing of red bricks on the ground storey had been pointed recently while the two upper storeys were plastered with dazzling white stucco the house was long fronted possessing a double row of lattice windows overlooking the gravel terrace at the head of the lawn a small square wing about thirty feet in height jutted from the left end of the front and appeared to belong to a different order of architecture this was the famous thirteenth century hall built during the reign of the first edward its steeply pointed roof was covered with grey slates the wide double door was resplendent with dark green paint and highly polished brass mrs moore as she continued to gaze at it reflected that the possession of so stylish and picturesque a dwelling would not disgrace her in the eyes of her social circle one might live here very comfortably isbel her niece gave a smile of vexation since you've absolutely determined to immure yourself in the heart of the wilds pray don't let us thrash that out again said the old lady the suburbs i cannot endure town flats are prisons while hotels will be impossible after you've left me here at all events i should have space and independence isbel turned away without replying the car stopped outside the hall porch with its green door it was exactly midday the sun glared down but a refreshing breeze fanned their faces the house was built on such an elevation that they could see a section of the distant country before them ada valley with the downs on both flanks and right down at its mouth the sea at shoreham marshall stamped to the ground with his foot this must be the original run hill that we're standing on has it a history then asked isbel every place must have a history to me the mere fact that the ancient saxons knew it by the same name is rather inspiring because you're of saxon blood i'm a celt as if that had anything to do with it and then saxons is a very general term there were saxon rustics and saxon pirates if you're referring to the latter i might feel sympathetic it must be awfully jolly to annihilate people you don't like possibilities anyhow mrs moore became impatient did we come here to discuss your character isbel or to see the house isbel grimaced in silence and jerked back once again the veil which kept straying over her shoulder having locked the wheel of the car marshall walked across to the hall door and tried the handle the door opened smoothly and noiselessly the ladies discarded their wraps and followed him into the house a small lobby brought them to the main hall its age loftiness and dim light reminded them of an ancient chapel it was two stories in height everything was of wood 
the dark oak angular roof was crossed by massive beams the walls were wainscoted the floor was of polished oak relieved only by a few persian rugs of dignified colours at the back of the hall half way up a landing or gallery ran across its entire breadth it was reached by a wide staircase with shallow steps heavily carpeted which formed the right-hand exit of the downstairs chamber two doors were underneath the gallery communicating with the interior of the house a big ancient fireplace occupied the centre of one of the side walls against the opposite one stood a modern steam heating apparatus three perpendicular windows over the lobby door had alternate diamond panes of coloured and uncoloured glass the colours were dark blue and crimson and whatever objects these rays fell upon was made beautiful and sombre the woodwork was in excellent repair and appeared newly polished all the appointments of the hall were bright spotless and in perfect condition judge evidently had had the place thoroughly restored and redecorated and yet the general effect was not quite satisfactory somehow it was discordant marshall gazed round him with an uncertain air rather over modernized isn't it i mean a place like this ought to be more a museum not at all said mrs moore it's a lounge i know but would anyone dream of using it as such could i smoke a pipe and read a newspaper here what i say is why not frankly make a show-place of it but how i don't know exactly what you're complaining of oh for heaven's sake don't be so obtuse aunt exclaimed isbel irritably he merely means it's all too spick and span when one goes back a few centuries one expects a certain amount of dust i quite agree with marshall and of course the furniture's hopeless what's wrong with the furniture oh it's a curiosity shop all styles and periods either mr judge has frantic taste or his wife had probably the late lamented i imagine him as the sort of man to be ruled entirely by shopmen and no one can accuse shopmen of being eccentric you're showing off to marshall said mrs moore curtly of one thing i'm certain mr judge must be a highly moral man order and cleanliness like this could only spring from a thoroughly self-respecting nature if soap and water constitutes morality retorted isbel time was precious they passed through the left-hand door beneath the gallery and found themselves in the dining-room it was a long low narrow dusky apartment extending lengthwise from the hall the noon sunshine filled it with solemn brightness but the hand of the past was upon everything and the girl's heart sank as she contemplated the notion of taking her meals here if only for a few months she became subdued and silent i fancy you're not impressed whispered marshall it's all so horribly weird i quite understand you think it would get on your nerves oh i can't express it it's ghostly of course i don't mean that the atmosphere seems tragical to me i should have a constant feeling that somebody or something was all the way waiting to trip me up i'm sure it's an unlucky house then you'd better tell your aunt i suppose you will have the final say in the matter no wait a bit said isbel they passed into the kitchens they were spotless up to date and fitted with all modern appliances mrs moore was delighted with all that she saw no expense has been spared here evidently she spoke out so far the house strikes me as eminently satisfactory in every way and i'm very glad you introduced it to my notice marshall if only the rest is equally convenient we're of one mind about this part of it anyway said isbel if i'm doomed to live at runhill this kitchen will be where i shall spend the greater part of my time her aunt gave her a sharp look do you mean that you don't like the rest of the house i'm not infatuated i couldn't stay long in that hall for example without reckoning how many coffins had been carried downstairs since it was first built 
"'Oh, rubbish, child! People die everywhere!' Isbel said nothing for a minute. Then, "'I wonder if she were old or young.' "'Who?' "'Mr. Judge's wife.' "'Why, what makes you think she might be young?' "'I have a sort of impression that she might be. I haven't succeeded in placing her in this house yet. Do you think he'll marry again, Marshall?' judging by the way he avoided women on board i should say not mrs moor glanced at her wrist-watch it's getting on towards half-past and we've two more floors to see yet we mustn't stand about they returned to the hall and immediately began the ascent of the main staircase so far they had neither seen nor heard anything of the american visitor everything in the house remained as still as death mrs priday too was a long time in putting in an appearance the landing which constituted a part of the hall was lighted by its windows the golden sunlight the black shadows cast by the balustrade the patches of deep blue and crimson produced a weird and solemn phantasmagoria of colour all the air smelt of eld they stopped for a minute at the top of the stairs looking down over the rail of the gallery into the hall mrs moore was the first to get to business again she took a rapid survey of their situation on the left the gallery came to a stop at the outer wall of a hall two doors faced them one opposite the head of the stairs the other which was ajar further along to the left on the right beyond the foot of a second flight of stairs leading upwards the landing extended forward as a long dark corridor having rooms on both sides the obscurity and a sharp turn prevented the end from being seen isbel called attention to a plaster nymph standing in an alcove mrs judge must have put that there she said rubbing her forehead and i'm sure she was little more than a girl her aunt regarded her askance. What do you know about it? I have a feeling. We'll ask Mrs. Priday when she comes. I think Mr. Judge is a very susceptible elderly gentleman, with a penchant for young women. Remember my words. At least you might have the decency to recollect that you're in his house. The words were hardly out of Mrs. Moore's mouth when they were startled by a strange sound. It came from the open door on their left, and was exactly like a single chord struck heavily on the piano. They looked at one another. "'Our transatlantic friend,' suggested Marshall. Mrs. Moore frowned. "'It's singular. He didn't hear us come in.' Another chord sounded, and then two or three more in quick succession. "'He's going to play,' said Isbel. "'Shall I go and investigate?' asked Marshall but Mrs. Moore held up her hand. The music had commenced. The ladies who possessed a wide experience of orchestral concerts immediately recognised the introduction to the opening movement of Beethoven's A Major Symphony. It did not take long to realise, however, that the American, if it were the American, was not so much attempting to render this fragment from Giantland as experimenting with it his touch was heavy and positive but he picked out the note so tardily he took such liberties with the tempo there were such long silences that the impression given was that he must be reflecting profoundly upon what he played mrs moore looked puzzled but isbel after her first shock of surprise grew interested she had an intuitive feeling that the unseen performer was not playing for the pleasure of the music but for some other reason but what this other reason could be she could not conceive could it be that he was a professional musician who was taking advantage of the presence of a grand piano to go over something in the work which was not quite clear in his mind or was the performance suggested by the house she knew the composition well but had never heard it played like that before the disturbing excitement of its preparations, as if a curtain were about to be drawn up, revealing a new, marvellous world. It was wonderful, most beautiful, really. 
then after a few minutes came the famous passage of the gigantic ascending scales and she immediately had a vision of huge stairs going up and after that suddenly dead silence the music had ceased abruptly she glanced round at her friends marshall was lounging over the rail of the gallery his back to the others stifling yawn after yawn her aunt was staring at the half-open door with an absent frown the pianist showed no sign of resuming two minutes passed and still the deathly silence remained unbroken marshall stood erect and grew restive but her aunt raised her hand for quiet isbel silently fingered her hair while they still waited the floor of the room from which the sounds had issued opened to its full extent and the musician appeared standing on the threshold tranquilly smoking a newly lighted cigarette End of chapter two chapter three of the haunted woman by david lindsay this librivox recording is in the public domain in the upstairs corridor the stranger was dressed in a summer suit of grey flannel and dangled a broad-brimmed panama hat in his hand nothing indicated that he had observed their little group mrs moore tapped her heel smartly on the floor he at once looked round but with perfect self-possession he was a shortish heavy-built man perhaps fifty years of age having a full florid face a dome-like forehead and a neck short thick and red an energetic intellectual type of person probably capable of prolonged periods of heavy mental exertion his head was bald to the crown the remaining fair was sandy red and he wore a short pointed beard of the same colour his somewhat large flat pale blue-grey eyes had that peculiar look of fixity which comes from gazing at one set of objects and thinking of something totally different are you the american gentleman interrogated mrs moore from a distance he strolled towards them before replying i do belong to the american nation his voice was thick but not unpleasant it had very little accent they told us you were here but we were not anticipating a musical treat he laughed politely i guess my apology will have to be that i forgot my audience madam i heard you all come in but you disappeared somewhere in the house and the circumstance went clean out of my mind mrs moore glanced at the bulky notebook stuffed into his side pocket and risked a shrewd conjecture artists we know are notoriously absent-minded why i do paint madam but i don't put that forward as an excuse for discourtesy then you were lost in the past we will say you have few such interesting memorials in your country we have some we are putting on years but i am interested in this house in a special sense my wife's great-grandfather was the former proprietor of it i don't know just how you call it here well the squire isbel fastened her steady grey-black eyes on his face but why were you playing beethoven in an empty house the singular softly metallic character of her voice seemed to attract his attention for he shot a questioning glance at her i was working something out he replied curtly after a brief hesitation is it permissible to inquire what he looked still more surprised you wish to know that some ideas came to me in this house which seemed to require music to illustrate them that particular music i mean do you know mr judge personally i do not isbel went on gazing at him meditatively and seemed inclined to pursue the conversation but at that moment a sound was heard in the hall below glancing over the balustrade they saw mrs priday entering from the lobby i'll have to be going remarked the american no one offered to detain him the ladies smiled while marshall raised his hat the artist bowed gravely clapped his own hat on and turned to go downstairs 
in the hall he stopped beside the caretaker for a moment in order to slip a coin into her hand after that he went out and the door closed behind him what is the name of that gentleman asked mrs moore of the woman as soon as the latter had joined them mr sherrop madam oh well mrs priday we've now seen the whole of the ground floor and we're waiting for you to show us over the rest if you will be so good and first of all what are those two doors there the drawing-room madam and what used to be the old library but mr judge has turned it into a billiard-room the new library's at the end of the corridor that's all the sitting-rooms on this floor very good then i think we'll first see the drawing-room mrs priday without delay ushered them into the apartment in which sherrop had been playing the piano it was immediately over the dining-room and had the same outlook its windows overlooked the side and back of the house quite evidently it was the sanctum of the late lady of the manor no man could have lived in that room so full of little feminine fragilities and knick-knacks as it was so bizarre so frivolous so tasteless yet so pleasing and underneath everything loomed up the past persisting in discovering itself despite the almost passionate efforts to conceal it a chill struck isabel's heart and at the same time she wished to laugh her taste she exclaimed couldn't she see it was all wrong how old was she mrs priday who miss the late mrs judge she was thirty-seven miss twenty years younger than her husband i wasn't so far out aunt were they happy together why shouldn't they be happy together miss young husbands are not always the kindest what was she like small slight and fair miss pretty and soft-spoken with a weakish mouth but the sharpest tongue that ever was mrs moore looked annoyed but isbel persisted with her questions did they get about together much yes and no miss she was one for society while the master likes no one's company so much as his own he will shut himself up with a book by the hour together and then he's fond of long tramps in the countryside and he belongs to an antiquarian society they go on excursions and such like did she go with them the caretaker smiled she hated them like a swarm of earwigs miss she used to call them most terrible names poor mrs judge how long have you been in service here demanded mrs moore eighteen years madam i married priday eighteen years ago he's been here all his life and his father and grandfather too many people they've seen come in and many people they've seen go out most interesting has mr judge been down here yet since his return not yet madam we've had letters and that's all they passed through the billiard-room isbel contrived to linger behind with marshall for a moment which is the room we have to see upstairs i think i told you it's called the east room i'm growing more fascinated now it certainly has an atmosphere of its own this house whether pleasant or unpleasant i can't decide yet he pressed her arm i sincerely hope you will like it for i don't see how our marriage is going to come off till your aunt gets fixed she looked back at him affectionately but said nothing meanwhile mrs moore had followed the caretaker into the corridor where she awaited them impatiently they proceeded without loss of time to visit the bedrooms on that floor some were large some were mere boxes but the appointments of all were modern hygienic and expensive whoever spent a night at runhill court was sure of a luxurious room the views too from the windows were magnificent nevertheless the same oppressive sense of antiquity pervaded everything and once again the same disagreeable doubt sprang up in isbel's mind it certainly isn't hard to understand how a place like this might affect a man's sanity if he lived here long enough she whispered to marshall i am sure i should begin to see things myself from the very first night but he must be mad what do you think probably should you like to meet him and judge for yourself yes marshall i'll see if i can arrange it please try i'm certain he's an extraordinary man 
quite apart from the question of hallucinations. The others by this time were in the library, where the younger couple had hastened to join them. Mrs. Moore at once drew Isbel into a corner of the room. We've seen practically everything that counts now. How are we to decide? I don't think I could live here, aunt, but don't settle on anything in a hurry. You can't imagine what strange thought I have. At one time I feel I hate and loathe the place, and at another I can't express what I feel. There's something very uncanny about it all, and yet it isn't ghostly in that sense. There's some living influence. I do wish we hadn't parted for Mr. Sherrop so abruptly. I feel positive he could have thrown some light on it. Your nerves must be desperately out of order, child, and, that being the case, I strongly doubt whether such a house as this is suitable for you. However, as you say, nothing need to be decided on the spur of the moment. Now, we'll see upstairs and then go home. It was nearly one o'clock. The upper landing had a low, sloping roof. It was lighted by a gable window facing the southwest. Opposite to the head of the stairs were two servants' rooms, while on the right hand a passage ran through to the other end of the house, dimly lighted along its entire length by skylights. Doors opened out here and there from both sides. Those on the right were dark lumber rooms, the others were the remaining servants' bedrooms, possessing windows which faced the back of the house. At the far end of the building, the servants' staircase came up from the ground floor. After a cursory walk through, the party returned to the other landing. "'Now, is that all?' demanded Mrs. Moore. "'Yes, madam.' Marshall pinched his chin thoughtfully. "'Which is the East Room?' "'It's locked, sir.' "'Locked, is it? But Mr. Judge told me he was giving instructions to have it opened.' "'I don't know anything about that, sir. It's locked.' "'That's unfortunate. At all events, show us where it is.' Mrs. Moore cast him a keen glance, but held her tongue. "'We shall have to go through a rather dark passage, sir. If you don't mind that, it's this way.' Parallel with and overlooking the stairs was another little corridor, stretching to the front of the house and lighted by a dormer window at the end. Along this Mrs. Priday conducted them. When they could nearly touch the sloping roof, the corridor turned sharply to the left and became a sort of tunnel. Marshall began to strike matches. "'By Jove, it is dark! It gets lighter directly, sir.' After twenty paces or so, there came another twist. A couple of shallow stairs brought them up into a widening of the passage, which might almost be described as a room. Its rafters were the interior of a great gable, through the high-set window of which the sun was slanting. Everything had been scrubbed clean, but there was not a stick of furniture. "'The man who designed this house must have had a queer brain,' remarked Isbel, with a smile. Do you mean to tell me that all this leads only to the one room? That's all, miss. They had paused for a minute to take advantage of the light, before plunging into the next section of night-like corridor. While they stood there, a look of perplexity appeared on Isabel's face, as she seemed to listen to something. What's that? she whispered. What? asked her aunt. Can't you hear a sound? They all listened. "'What's it like, Isabel?' inquired Marshall. "'Surely you can hear it. A kind of low, vibrating hum, like a telephone wire while you're waiting for a connection.' But no one else could catch the noise. "'Judge spoke of some sound in a corridor,' said Marshall. "'He told me everyone couldn't hear it. Kind of a thunder, is it?' "'Yes, yes, perhaps. It keeps coming and going. A low buzz.' That must be it, then, unless, of course, it's a ringing in your ears. Isabel uttered a short laugh of annoyance. Oh, surely I can tell a sound when I hear one. It's exactly as if I were listening on the telephone for an answer to a call. Her voice might speak at any moment. Foolishness, said her aunt irritably. If it's anything at all, it's probably an outside wire of some sort. Come along. 
i can't understand why nobody else hears it it's so unmistakable well nobody else does child that's enough are you coming or are you not it's really quite impressive though like an orchestra heard through a thick wall the question is are we to stay here until you've succeeded in working yourself up into a fit of enthusiasm over it i wonder if this is what mr sherrop heard very likely it is it certainly does give one the idea of a preparation for something it's exciting oh don't glare at me aunt as if i were some wild animal i'm quite in my right senses i assure you that may be so but if it's a joke i don't know why you should fix on lunch-time for it how much longer do you propose to keep us here may i ask isbel at last consented to proceed but there was a strange look in her eyes for all the rest of the time she was upstairs the second section of unlighted passage led to another gable room and this in turn was succeeded by a third but shorter tunnel towards the end it was dimly illuminated by a skylight the passage was terminated by a plain oak door is this the east room asked marshall yes sir he tried the handle but the door was locked well that's no go then why is it kept locked asked mrs moore because mr judge wishes it madam they could not tell from mrs priday's expression whether she were being impertinent or merely simple isbel however hazarded another question is the room haunted please i say is the room haunted the caretaker smiled as she wrapped her hands in the apron she wore if you mean ghosts miss i've never heard of any such i'm simply asking if it has the reputation of being queer in any way well for one thing miss it's very old priday says it's far and away the oldest part of the house all this end is it wouldn't be natural if no stories was told about an ancient room like this what kind of stories ah oh, my husband's the one for all that miss he'll tell you all you want to know about the house if you can get him to talk that is not many can the master never could get much out of him the pridays have served here for more than a hundred years and it's to be expected that my husband knows a goodish bit about the place which he doesn't want to lose by selling to the first asker you talk to him miss and if he's in the mood he'll tell you some funny stories i don't pretend to know much about it myself do you say that this part of the house is older than the hall asked marshall my husband says it's nigh fifteen centuries old sir only it's been patched up from time to time and made to look more like the rest of the house that's rather interesting i wonder if judge knew it no one answered him mrs moore again consulted her wrist-watch we really must be getting back we shall lose our lunch you'll have to see the room some other time marshall if it's a case of necessity there was nothing else to do and they retraced their steps returning through the corridor they descended the stairs when once again in the hall the ladies thanked mrs priday and prepared to go outside but marshall stayed behind for a moment to slip a treasury note in her hand Friday himself opened the lodge gate to allow the car to pass. He was a tough, wrinkled little fellow of about fifty-five, with cheeks like Kentish apples and a pair of small, wary, twinkling, slow black eyes. Isbel viewed him with great curiosity, but no words were exchanged. Then we'll run over there again next weekend, providing I can get the key of that room asked marshall of isbel on the same evening at the hotel she looked at him closely yes and when you write to mr judge hint to him that aunt is quite prepared to bid for the house you know how to put it but is that definite certainly she may not know her own mind but i know it for her you'll do that you'd be prepared to live there yourself for a few months yes for it's such a short time that it makes no difference one way or the other and she lifted her hand to her hair with such an air of cold abstraction that marshall thought she was really bored by the whole affair End of chapter three
Chapter Four of The Haunted Woman by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Legend of Ulf's Tower. The fine weather ran into Sunday. Mrs. Moore went to church in the morning, while Isbel dragged the unwilling Marshall with her to the West Pier to hear music. In honour of his return, she had today, for the first time, got back into colours and was wearing a light summer frock with cerise hat her pale face was powdered as usual she was a good deal stared at as they sauntered through the double row of seated people which had the effect of irritating her for she was not feeling in a particularly social humour she had slept abominably on the previous night the band was playing in the pavilion but the windows were open and they could hear perfectly well outside they sank into a couple of deck chairs which happened to be vacant an undistinguished valse was just slowing to a finish a minute later isbel nudged her escort with a significant glance she directed his attention to his neighbour on the other side it was sherop shall i speak he whispered of course Marshall drew reflectively at his cigarette, making no sign until the piece ended. Then he turned to the other good-humouredly. "'Bit warm this morning, Mr. Sherrop?' The thick, red-bearded American was in the act of wiping his overheated brow with an ornate handkerchief. He slipped it away and calmly passed his hand over to the underwriter. The tail of his eye rested for a single instant on Isbel's face but he did not venture to claim the acquaintanceship. "'You've got my name, I see. The caretaker told us. My own name's Stokes, and this is Miss Lomont.' Sherrop rose and bowed. "'Staying long in Brighton?' inquired Marshall. "'No, I'm getting back to London in the morning, en route to Italy. You won't be seeing Judge, then. You don't know him personally, I think you said.' "'Why, no, I've never met him. My wife wished me to take that house in on my trip.' so I wrote to him about it, and he was good enough to mail me an order. That's all my connection with Mr. Judge. You know he's just back from America. They told me at the house. Isbel whispered to Marshall to change seats. He obeyed, and she found herself between the two men. Still in quest of music, it seems, Mr. Sherrop. He laughed. Oh, well, music was invented for lonely men. Your wife isn't with you, then? You mustn't blame me for that, Miss Lomont. It wasn't my fault. She just wouldn't come, scared of the sea. Is it a professional trip for you, or a holiday? Oh, I'm seeing the galleries, that's all. What is your particular branch of art? I'm a portrait painter. How awfully interesting. But don't you have to accept commissions from all sorts of objectionable types? There are no objectionable types, Miss Lomont. In an art sense, every man and woman alive is an individual problem, with special features you won't find elsewhere. I never looked at it in that light. It must be so. But how absorbing you must find it all. Marshall got up. I'm going to hunt for cigarettes, if you'll both excuse me. Stay here, Isabel. I won't be long. No, don't be long. She turned again to Sherrop. Do you find you get most of your applications from women or men? The sexes are about equally vain, Miss Lomont. But maybe the ladies are ahead in self-enthusiasm. I couldn't supply the statistics off-hand. She laughed. A light entr'acte struck up, and further conversation was postponed for a few minutes. Isbel began to tap the pier flooring with the tip of her sunshade nervously and absently. As the last note sounded, she threw a hurried glance to the right, to see if Marshall were returning, and then leant over, almost confidentially, towards her companion. "'Tell me, what did you really think of that house yesterday?' "'A real impressive old pile, Miss Lomont. "'Nothing more?' He gave her a guarded look. "'I guess a house can't be much more than a house.' "'What made you sit down to that piano, then?' "'Oh, that!' He removed his hat, and slowly pressed his hand over his broad, prominent forehead. My little performance has surely struck your imagination. I thought we were through with that yesterday. But it was a strange notion, you must admit. Perhaps I'm a strange character, Miss Lomont. Don't let's fence. 
mr stokes will be back directly i want to know please what had the house to do with it sherrop hesitated i had some sensations i thought so and where did you have them wasn't it in the gable of that dark corridor on the top floor there was a short pause we look to be in the same boat miss lomont then it was there not there but near there it was outside the door of that room they call the east room these days it used to be ulf's tower did you get as far yes and what was it you heard heard oh i guess you're referring to the sound in that passage no it wasn't that miss lomont then what was it tell me what happened she spoke quickly nothing happened we were talking of sensations weren't we i'm an artist miss lomont and that means a bundle of live nerves my mind gets troubled maybe ten or twenty times a day without my ever guessing what for this one was what you might call a bad seismic disturbance and there's no more to it perhaps you think my questions are prompted by inquisitiveness it isn't that my aunt may be buying runhill court and if she does i shall have to live there so you see my interest is quite legitimate sherrop watched her professionally the quivering nostrils the nervous mouth the peculiar expression of the grey-black eyes fascinated without satisfying him her character possessed an important quality which he was unable to locate on her features it was contained only in that quiet pleasant yet metallic and foreign toned voice i can't tell you much he said at length and then there was another silence isbel glanced around her rather guiltily still i feel you can tell me something can't we talk it over together somewhere obviously it's out of the question here she laughed without conviction i know it sounds terribly melodramatic still you understand my point of view don't you i shall feel honoured and delighted but you'll sure be disappointed when you see how little i have to hand over miss lomont and another thing i'm away to-morrow morning as i told your friend by what train eleven a m she pondered marshall would depart for town three hours earlier than that let us fix up something can you be outside the turnstiles of this pier to-morrow morning at ten o'clock sharp that would allow you ample time to catch your train right ten sharp i'll be there i rely on you mind oh i keep my appointments miss lomont said the american isbel was about to say something else when turning her eyes she observed marshall approaching during his absence his chair had been appropriated by a pale stout flabby lady of uncertain age with a drooping mouth and eyes which positively snapped the usurpation had passed unnoticed by the others sherrop rose i'll quit you take my seat mr stokes i'll have a turn along the front till luncheon next morning isbel breakfasted early with marshall and saw him depart for the station as he intended returning to brighton for the following week-end the car and the major portion of his belongings were left behind at ten o'clock she was outside the west pier sherrop who already waited there immediately came up to her raising his hat and removing the cigar from his mouth let's walk towards hove she suggested it's less crowded that way he assented in dry silence it was most kind of you to come out of your way for me began isbel after all we are total strangers now don't say that i feel as if i'd known you quite a long time my cigar doesn't worry you any no please all right now let's get to business time's short miss lomont well now i'm here for i conclude is to specify my sensations at runhill on saturday there wasn't anything else was there it won't embarrass you oh well i'm not easily embarrassed now i told you where it all happened outside the door of that east room honestly that was one of the things i came to see i could have just kicked myself when i found that lock fast first of all you did hear the sound in that corridor didn't you my friends didn't that's why i ask yes i heard it like the far-away scrape of a double bass yes yes it was like that 
i couldn't identify the sound it reminded me of but that was it it's tough to explain but it might be in the nature of a flow from that east room to another part of the house caused by what i can't say but is that what was troubling you it was so horribly uncanny i can almost hear it still anyway we'll quit that and come to my experience it isn't a mile long when i stood outside that door just after trying to burgle the lock for i had my knife out to it a kind of smell came wafting over me of a sudden now i don't want you to smile miss lomond there needn't be anything funny in a smell i know and you know that a smell can be the powerfulest variety of sensation when it sets out to be you can't kill a man by sight or sound but i wouldn't like to say you couldn't kill him with some smells and not always disagreeable ones at that that just shows the superior sensitiveness of the nose as an organ i would like for somebody to take that up as an art well this particular odour was of the delirious species it was like the epitome of a spring day in the woods all the scents of the pines and the violets and the rich moist dark brown soil and whatever else comes carried to you by the breezes only all double distilled as if it was the spillings of a bottle of a new sort of women's perfume and then call to mind where i smelt it all miss lomond in a dark dusty airless corridor of an ancient house which god's air hasn't blown through for centuries i jumped nearly then it passed away quite suddenly again i figure it didn't last all told more than ten seconds but after it was gone i stood there kind of transfigured like a man that has just seen a vision it wasn't till it quitted that i saw its importance it was like a waft from another world that house is alive miss lomond is that the whole that's all it's very very strange but still i don't quite see why it should have suggested that music to you yes now why did it but somehow it did i can't explain it to myself the suggestion thought has gone and i can't recover it the orchestra was tuning up something big was going to happen something like that you mustn't press the resemblance too close any kind of big symphonic music might have done but i just chose that it must have seemed more appropriate isbel tried unsuccessfully to put indifference into her voice as she asked the question i'm going to make what you may consider a very singular inquiry mr sherrop was your reason for playing that music the fact that the passage of the ascending scales suggested to you the idea of a mysterious gigantic staircase he blew out a cloud of smoke at the same time looking at her from the corner of his eye why should that be i do not know why it should be or why it should not be but was it so it was not you appear to know something i don't miss lomond what staircase oh nothing it was just a foolish question shall we turn back they did so isbel nervously cast in her mind for a change of conversation you say that room used to go by another name how was that it was called ulf's tower the story is that ulf was the original builder of the house he lived about a hundred years after the first landing of the south saxons four or five houses have been put up on the same site since then but the name struggled through till a couple of centuries ago my wife's ancestor michael bourdon set it all down in his papers the history of runhill court goes back to the sixth century anno domini but why should that particular room have been selected to preserve his memory oh well because the missing rooms of the legend were supposed to be immediately above that side of the house that's quite clear i've heard no legend what missing rooms you surely surprise me i guessed every man woman and child in the old country would know about the lost rooms of runhill court when ulf built his house miss lomond it was on haunted land runhill was a waste elevation inhabited by trolls which i figure were a variety of malevolent land sprites ulf didn't care though he was a pagan he built his house i gather he was a tough fellow away above the superstitions of his time and country and well one day ulf disappears and a part of his house with him some of the top rooms of the tower were clean carried off by the trolls it happened to be the east end of the house the nearest to their happy hunting grounds 
that was the very last that was heard of Ulf. But all through the centuries, folks have been jumping up to announce that they've caught sight of the lost rooms. That's the fable. They walked along in silence. Then, would you advise me to live in that house? asked Isbel suddenly, with an unsteady smile. Sherrup smoked for quite a minute before answering. If you ask that, Miss Lomond, you must have a reason for asking it. Tell me what you feel. Confessions are so awkward, and I'm not sure you won't laugh. I won't laugh. Well, then, when I was listening to that weird sound in that passage, it suddenly seemed to strike a very deep string in my heart, which had never been struck before. It was a kind of passion. It was passion, but there was something else in it besides joy. My heart felt sick and tormented, and there was a horrible sinking sensation of despair. But the delight was there all the time, and was the strongest. It only lasted a very short time, but I don't think I could ever forget it. Yes, I know, said Sherrup. Then tell me what it means, and what I'm to do. He threw away his cigar. Do nothing, Miss Lomond, and ask no questions. That's the advice of a man who has daughters of his own. Not to live there, you mean? No. He made an emphatic side gesture with his hand. Cut it right out. A house like that is going to do you no good. Shall I tell you what you are, Miss Lomond? You are an artist without a profession. You're like a lightning rod without an outlet. You want to steer clear of all kinds of storms. Oh, I'm not a portrait painter for nothing. Your nervous system is shining through all right. Well, you asked me for it, so I've handed it out. But honestly, I wouldn't take on that house. If you feel like that at the beginning, what are you going to feel like after a while? It's too risky. Thank you, she said quietly. I think I will take your advice. I'm afraid I'm rather highly strung by nature, although, oddly enough, not one of my friends appears to have any suspicion of the fact. I pass for being stolid rather than otherwise. You are almost the first to give me credit for exceptional feelings. When they had arrived opposite the pier once more, Sherrup took his departure. So strong was the impression made upon him by Isbel's personality, that in the train, before it started, he was induced to commit her elusive features to one of the pages of his precious sketch-book. When it was completed, however, he shook his head with an air of profound dissatisfaction. It was a good likeness, but he still couldn't get that voice into the picture. End of chapter 4「by David Lindsay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Isbel sees herself. Marshall came down again by train on Friday evening. Judge had replied to him during the week, notifying that he was still considering the question of parting with his house, but hoped before long to come to a definite decision. Meanwhile, no useful purpose would appear to be served by a personal interview with the lady desiring to purchase, but he was willing to undertake to give her the first refusal of the estate. He enclosed the key of the East Room. Marshall communicated only the business part of the letter to Mrs. Moore. The fine weather continuing, he took the ladies on Saturday for a long run through Sussex and Kent. They wound up with the theatre at night. On Sunday morning, at the breakfast table, Isbel announced to her aunt the intention of herself and Marshall to motor over to Runhill Court before lunch. Mrs. Moore, although a rigid church-goer, manifested neither pleasure nor displeasure. "'But you will be back for lunch this time?' "'Oh, yes. Marshall merely wants to carry out his commission.' "'I know you don't like the house.' so I needn't warn you against prematurely falling in love with it. I've got a strong feeling he won't part with it. Why not? asked Marshall. Oh, I've had some experience of these heartbroken old widowers. He's far more likely to pick up another wife than to renounce an old familiar home. At this time of life, he's not so much a man as a bundle of habits. Fifty-eight's not so old. Too old for a new establishment. 
but not too old for a new wife repeated mrs moore with a shade of contempt her niece reached for the marmalade dish i expect there are women who would marry him he must be decently well off of course and even quite young girls if it's beauty he wants he'll find a wife easier to get than a good cook mark my words within twelve months a second mrs judge will be installed in that house i thought you were an admirer of his said isbel nonchalantly i admire his thoroughness in practical matters but that doesn't blind my eyes to probabilities in other words you think he's treating you badly by keeping you on tenterhooks own up aunt you're quite mistaken child i'm not attacking him i'm simply finding reasons for his not being able to make up his mind it's his own house and he can do what he likes with it however it was obvious that mrs moore was annoyed the two younger people left brighton soon after ten o'clock and as the road was now more familiar they reached runhill lodge almost upon the stroke of eleven mrs priday did not appear this time it was her husband who attended the gate he wore a black coat in honour of the day and was smoking a nicotine-stained wooden pipe carved in the likeness of a man's head marshall showed him a corner of judge's letter with the signature following it up with a small pourboire which the head gardener thrust indifferently into his pocket can we get into the house now yes sir are you at liberty priday answered in the affirmative as a matter of fact it's only one room we have to see we went over all the rest last time the east room it was locked when we were here before but i've got the key since the gardener gazed at him with his cunning eyes for a moment and then asked cautiously as if feeling his way now why would the boss be having that room open sir any particular reason why it shouldn't be opened it's been kept locked up for eight years sir and that's one good reason why demanded isabel or oh, there is nothing there for nobody then why waste a good lock finding that priday did not reply she proceeded i understand its real name is ulf's tower what name ulf's tower i never heard that miss in my grandfather's time the old uns used to call it the elves tower how extraordinary i wonder which version is the right one well we can be talking about all this when we get to the house said marshall if you will get the key and let us through while priday went into the lodge isbel closed her eyes and pressed her hand to her forehead i am afraid i've a headache coming on is it the sun if so the sooner we get inside the better it must be the hot sun the gardener reappeared almost immediately with the key in his hand and at once set about opening the carriage gate marshall got back into the car isbel had not alighted they passed through the gate was closed behind them and priday having been invited to mount they ran smoothly up the drive and within a minute or two were outside the house as they stood waiting by the door while priday fumbled with the lock the throbbing of isbel's temples grew so unendurable that she hardly knew how to remain erect worse inquired marshall with some anxiety i'm afraid so i wish he'd hurry up at the same moment that she spoke the door was got open and marshall supported her into the cool of the hall where she sat down the two men remained standing beside her this is better but i fear i can't go on for a minute or two after a pause she addressed priday more conversationally so you know nothing about the east room there's no so about it was the blunt though not offensive reply i never said i didn't but you say there's nothing there there ain't nothing there that you want miss what do i want you've come on a picnic like this house ain't going to be played with perhaps it'll bite back and bite hard this language which would have sounded imbecile in another place seemed almost like a threat to isbel in their present situation surrounded as they were by the solemn silent remains of an extreme antiquity she discontinued her questions 
marshall however who preserved his common sense took up the story what exactly do you mean by that Friday? gentlemen like you sir can go anywhere about the house you'll see or hear nothing and it won't hurt you young female nerves is a very different matter perhaps those who start a funny journey can't always come back when they like the young lady's got a headache you say that's a good enough excuse let her rest here sir while you and me go up to see what you want to see oh rot you want to come don't you isbel very much but really i'm physically incapable of moving my head gets worse instead of better then i shall stop with you or would you like me to get the job over i could be up and down again in ten minutes say what you'd like yes please go take mr priday with you i think complete silence and solitude may do me good talking makes it worse i wish to heaven i could do something for you you sure you don't mind being left she gave a feeble reassuring smile good gracious i'm not a child marshall took his departure reluctantly upstairs accompanied by priday whose legs however stiffened by a lifetime of digging were soon unable to keep pace with those of the young underwriter isbel now kept shutting and reopening her eyes the repose silence and gloom began to exercise a soothing effect on her nerves and she had not sat there two minutes before her head became easier everything in the hall was as it had been on the occasion of their previous visit the dark dignified polished woodwork was solemnly illuminated as before by the golden blue and crimson rays from the medieval windows and there was the same deathly stillness suddenly it occurred to her that she was looking at something the existence of which she had never yet realised it was part of the structure of the hall and she must certainly have seen it before but if so it had completely escaped her observation it was a second flight of uncarpeted stairs leading upwards out of the hall by the side of the ancient fireplace it did not strike her that there was anything odd about these stairs they were quite prosaic and real the only curious circumstance was that hitherto she should have overlooked them in so miraculous a manner they went straight forward and up through an aperture in the wall about a dozen steps were visible but the top was out of sight it immediately flashed across her mind that by ascending them she would set foot into a heretofore unexplored part of the house in the excitement of the discovery she forgot her headache she got up stood for a moment in doubt wondering whether she should call out to marshall and then deciding that her voice would not carry so far and that it would be time enough to acquaint him with her find on his reappearance she resolved in the meantime to do a little pioneering on her own account not once did it enter her brain to identify these stairs with those of judge they appeared in a different quarter of the house and moreover were too solid and tangible to conjure up the faintest suspicion of anything supernatural she was not in the least alarmed merely intensely surprised and curious deliberately but with a slightly agitated pulse she ascended the steps one by one occasionally turning to look back down at the hall something in the whole proceeding occurred to her as mysterious though she was unable to explain to herself just what it was the steps were of a dark shining wood which resembled teak there were from bottom to top seventeen of them there was no handrail but the walls enclosed the well of the staircase on either side at the head of the flight she found herself standing in a little room about fifteen feet square empty of furniture and lighted from above although no skylight was visible the floor walls and ceiling were of the same dark handsome wood as the staircase it was a kind of antechamber there was nothing to see there and nowhere to sit down but there were doors leading out of it there were three of them one in the centre of each of the three walls the head of the stairs occupying the centre of the fourth all were of plain undecorated wood 
investing them with an almost primitive air. All three were closed. Isbel hesitated. She wished to proceed, but those closed doors seemed to hold a sort of menace. She now remembered that Mrs. Priday had omitted to show these rooms with the rest of the house. Or was it that she had thought they had already seen them prior to her arrival? Or again, like the East Room, they might be locked. They too might contain undesirable mysteries. On that point, of course, she would satisfy herself at once, if it were really possible to go any further. Could it have been something of the same feeling that leads a woman to scrutinise an envelope addressed in an unfamiliar handwriting for several moments before opening it, which induced Isbel to pause for so long outside those doors? It was naturally absurd to suppose that she was actually frightened, so she told herself, and yet, somehow, she could not bring herself to adopt the sensible plan of peeping in. The fact was, there was something not quite right about them. They were unlike other doors, and not only were they unlike other doors, they were unlike each other. In that fact, perhaps, consisted their chief strangeness. The door in the middle which she faced looked noble, stately, and private, whereas the right-hand one had, she could not describe it to herself, a dangerous, waiting appearance, as though the room it belonged to were inhabited, and the door at any moment might be flung suddenly open. As for that on the left, most likely it opened onto a passageway. That was the impression it gave her. Perhaps all this hypersensitiveness on her part had its origin in the mutual position of the walls. For some minutes she was incapable either of impelling herself forward or dragging herself away. She remained standing in nervous embarrassment, biting her gloved fingertips and smiling at her own weakness. Perhaps she ought to descend again to the hall and wait for Marshall. He might have returned by this time and be wondering what had become of her. It was most extraordinary that he too hadn't noticed these stairs. Unable to muster sufficient courage to attack any of the doors unsupported, she at last determined to return for his assistance. But she had made no allowance for whim. While her foot was still on the second stair from the top, she turned straight round, then walked with a springing action across the room to the left-hand door, and defiantly flinging it wide open, stood on the threshold, staring in with startled eyes. The room was even smaller than that outside, its fittings were all of the same dark wood. There was no furniture, but a large oval mirror hung on one of the walls, and on the side of the room furthest from the door was a long, rich red curtain which seemed to conceal another door. Isbel took a tentative step forward. She kept asking herself what these rooms could be for, to what part of the house they belonged, and why they had been left unfurnished. Abstractedly, she walked over to the mirror to adjust her hat. Either the glass was flattering her, or something had happened to make her look different. She was quite startled by her image. It was not so much that she appeared more beautiful, as that her face had acquired another character. Its expression was deep, stern, lowering. Yet everything was softened and made alluring by the pervading presence of sexual sweetness. The face struck a note of deep underlying passion, but a passion which was still asleep. It thrilled and excited her. It was even a little awful to think that this was herself, and still she knew that it was true. She really possessed this tragic nature. She was not like other girls, other English girls. Her soul did not swim on the surface, but groped its way blindly miles underneath the water. But how did the glass come to reflect this secret? And what was the meaning of this look of enchanting sexuality which nearly tormented herself? She spent a long time gazing at the image, but without either changing the position of her head or moving a muscle of her countenance. Petty, womanish vanity had no share in her scrutiny. She did not wish to admire, 
she wished to understand herself it seemed to her that no woman possessing such a strong terrible sweetness and intensity of character could avoid accepting an uncommon and possibly fearful destiny a flood of the strangest emotions slowly rose to her head she heard a man's voice calling her name from a very long way off the voice was muffled as if by intervening walls but she had no difficulty recognising it as marshall's she guessed that he was shouting down from the top of the house and that on getting no response he would quicken his descent to the hall she would have to go and meet him before retracing her steps however it was of course essential to peep behind the curtain hastening across to it she pulled aside the heavy red drapery there was revealed a doorway but no door another flight of wooden stairs started to go down immediately beyond isbel persuaded herself that she would still have time to explore a little halfway down the hall came into sight she could not understand near the bottom she realised that she was coming out by the side of the fireplace in other words that this staircase was identical with that by which she had ascended how this could possibly be however she had no more opportunity of asking herself for at that moment she reached the hall and at the very instant that her foot touched the floor every detail of her little adventure flashed out of her mind like the extinguishing of a candle she remembered having commenced the ascent of those stairs she was perfectly conscious of the ascent of those stairs she was perfectly conscious that she had that very minute come down them but of all that had happened to her in the interim she had no recollection whatever she turned round to look at the staircase again it had vanished it was then for the first time that she recalled mr judge's story instinct informed her that the whole transaction must be concealed from marshall she required time to think it over quietly and tranquilly in all its bearings before taking him into her confidence if indeed she should ever decide to do so he was very unlikely to put a charitable construction on her tale it would almost certainly cause disagreement and general unpleasantness it would be far better never to say anything about it at all she sat down and waited for him her headache had returned presently marshall followed by priday entered the hall but not from upstairs from outside he appeared rather distracted and on catching sight of isbel his face flushed up where in the name of wonder have you been all this time all which time what is the time it's well past twelve i've been looking for you a good twenty minutes oh where were you she forced a smile while thinking rapidly evidently i wasn't here since you didn't see me as a matter of fact i went outside for a few minutes priday regarded her with a dubious stare even so you must have heard me shouting said marshall my dear marshall are you trying to be unpleasant or what if i had heard you i should have answered perhaps i dropped off to sleep i can't say my head was bad and i was sitting under some trees with my eyes closed i really don't think that you need to make such a fuss about it did you see the room of course we saw it it's just a room like any other room nothing mysterious oh that's all bunkum well are you fit or would you like to wait a bit longer she got up slowly we'd better go marshall looked at her strangely but said nothing more they left the house marshall went across to the car but isbel stopped for a minute to address priday who was engaged in locking the door so i should have run no great risk in that room after all mr priday he finished his task before looking up or replying that may be miss but i ain't taking nothing back and what's more i ain't so sure you ain't seen too much as it is really this is most uncalled for she exclaimed laughing why what do you imagine i've seen you know and i don't miss 
all i say is i see a difference in you since forty minutes ago an improvement i hope mr priday you're amusing yourself with me miss and that's all right but i ain't one to speak of what i don't know and i sticks to it and you mark my words this house ain't one for young ladies like yourself there's plenty more old houses in the kingdom for you to see over if you want such come along isbel called out marshall impatiently from the car don't stand gassing there with your bad head as she obeyed and took her seat the smile dropped from her face leaving it so puckered and anxious looking that he uttered an involuntary exclamation by jove you do look washed out isbel made no reply but after they had repassed through the lodge gate she unobtrusively produced a small mirror of polished silver from her handbag and carefully scrutinized her features she certainly was not looking very attractive but otherwise she could detect no special change in her appearance. End of chapter 5